When we last saw the central character in this series, Fred Harvey, at the end of part one of this series, his world was falling apart. At 26 years old, with a young wife and brand new baby, and a bustling restaurant business in St. Louis, Missouri, the Civil War tore apart his world when martial law was declared in St. Louis. Just days before Anne gave birth to baby Eddie, seven southern states had declared independence and formed the Confederacy. Days after the birth, Lincoln was sworn in as president. Although much of the population of St. Louis was pro-Union, the governor, Claiborne Jackson, declared allegiance to the Confederacy and set up a nearby military camp to oppose the Union, and many pro-slavery citizens joined him. When the Union Army came and arrested all in the camp, a local rebellion broke out. A Union soldier was shot by someone in a rowdy crowd of protesters, and when the Union soldiers returned fire, at least 20 citizens were killed, including women and children, enraging the protesters further. The Union took over the camp and the nearby St. Louis arsenal that would provide weapons and munitions for the Union cause. Missouri Governor Claiborne Jackson fled to Texas and set up a government in exile, which became an official part of the Confederacy. Shortly thereafter, martial law was imposed in St. Louis. Meanwhile, Fred Harvey's business partner in ownership of the Merchant's Dining Saloon and Restaurant fled to join the rebellion taking with him all the savings of profits from the business, leaving Fred penniless. Business from travelers on the Mississippi ground to a halt in the midst of the threat of war all around, and with no customers to rebuild the business, Fred lost the restaurant. It was at that point that Fred took a detour from his trajectory in the restaurant industry that would someday bring him national fame. A long and convoluted detour, but one that would equip him in many ways to eventually become the powerhouse hospitality industry giant who revolutionized the world of tourism. The first part of his detour took him away from any connection to the restaurant business and plunked him into the packet boat business. A packet boat was a particular type of medium-sized steamship, and in the U.S. they were mostly used along the Mississippi and Missouri River. They were not designed as dedicated freighters to carry huge loads of goods, nor designed specifically to carry passengers for business or pleasure. In fact, their original first purpose was to carry mail for the U.S. government's mail service over long distances. The payment by the government for mail service wasn't anywhere near enough to pay for all the running expenses of such boats. So packet boats were built to have cargo space designed to hold all sorts of goods, from bales of cotton to furniture, that individuals or businesses could pay to have shipped. And eventually they began adding passenger compartments for travelers who would pay to travel to their destination. The earliest packet boat passenger accommodations were crude and uncomfortable, but by the 1860s, some of the packet boats had been upgraded to add luxurious cabin space and fine dining. One such lavish boat in the 1850s was named the De Vernon, with 100 berths for passengers and all the travel amenities similar to luxury ocean passenger liners. It made regular trips on the Mississippi from St. Louis, Missouri to St. Paul, Minnesota. For years, it had a famous captain named Rufus Ford, and it just so happened that in 1861, before the start of the war, Captain Ford was one of Fred Harvey's favorite and regular customers at the Merchant's Dining Saloon and Restaurant. Just weeks before things fell apart for Fred Harvey, Captain Ford had been telling Fred about the new packet boat company he had started. Business was booming and he needed dependable employees to keep his boats running on time, what with all the war-related chaos swirling around the situation. After martial law was imposed in St. Louis and Ford realized Fred was in desperate need of a job, he offered to employ him. The only condition is that Fred would have to move his family clear across the state from the metropolis of St. Louis to the western edge of Missouri to a small town of less than 10,000 named St. Joseph. In the late 1850s, a new railroad had been constructed across the northern part of Missouri called the 
Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad. It connected Mark Twain's hometown, Hannibal, Missouri, north of St. Louis on the western shore of the Mississippi, to the farthest point west in Missouri, the town of St. Joseph right on the eastern shore of the Missouri River. In the eastern U.S., the railroad business was dominated by a few very, very rich, well-known and powerful tycoons, including Cornelius Vanderbilt, Andrew Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan. But out on the western frontier, the biggest name in railroads was the Joy System, a loose conglomeration of regional railroads headed by a Detroit lawyer named James F. Joy. The new Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad had hired Captain Ford to set up packet boat service along the Missouri River to get people and goods from Missouri across the very rough river to the edge of Kansas so they could continue on to Omaha, Nebraska, and farther points west. Of course, when the H and SJ Railroad was first in service, those people going on from the west shore of the Missouri would have to use stagecoaches or wagon service to continue on their trip. The part of America east of the Mississippi at the time was bustling with railroads all over the place. But west of the Mississippi, only California, Oregon, and Texas had a few small isolated railroads running between some towns. The new H and SJ Railroad wasn't real dependable in the beginning. Its track system was pretty rickety, and thus there were frequent derailments. In fact, that earned it the popular nickname that made the H, S, and J stand for the horrible and slow jolting. But its station in Little St. Joseph was the westernmost point in the eastern U.S. railroad system, which gave it influence far beyond what the rickety railroad should have had. The U.S. government made St. Joe the hub for the entire nation's transcontinental mail. All mail ended up there and then was sorted and sent its way west on packet boats and eventually stagecoaches. The city was also the endpoint for all the Western Union Telegraph wires from the east, which is how it ended up in 1860 as the home of the brand new Pony Express. Telegraph messages coming from the east and headed to destinations on the west coast would be transcribed by hand to paper letters at the Western Union office in St. Joseph. Then the stacks of letters would be handed off to a Pony Express rider at the Pony office to put in locked pouches on a bag that went under his saddle. The rider would take a ferry across the Missouri River to Elwood, Kansas, and then head directly to pick up a horse at the Pony Express stable there. And he would jump on the horse and head out at full speed for the first leg of the route that would take the mail ultimately close to 1,900 miles away, ending up in Sacramento, California. Of course, the first rider and the first horse on the route didn't make the whole trip. A Prony Express station was placed about every 10 miles apart along the route, as that was about as far as a good horse could ride at top speed. At each station, a rider would leave his horse and get a fresh one. A Pony Express home station that provided food and lodging for the riders would be available every 75 miles or so. There, the rider would hand the mail over to a new rider who would head out immediately to make sure the mail took no more than 10 days to get from St. Joseph to Sacramento. Each rider would end up riding from 75 to 100 miles during his shift and could be riding either day or night. The mail kept moving 24 hours a day. Fred Harvey and his family were plunked down right in the middle of the excitement of that time in the center of the action at St. Joseph, Missouri. One of the main sources of information, documentation, and quotations for this series of videos is Stephen Fried's exceptional biography of Fred Harvey and his family titled Appetite for America. In that book, Fried tells us what happened next after the move to St. Joseph. Fred quickly learned about the life on the silty, temperamental Missouri River, the Big Muddy, which was prone to freezing every winter, indiscriminately flooding or drying out every summer and generally presenting endless challenges to Captain Ford's packet boats. There were passengers to feed and entertain. Many of the boats had impressive restaurants and saloons, as well as cargo to care for and schedules to meet. It was a demanding and intriguing business which showed Fred a world, worlds actually, 
he had never seen living in two of America's largest cities. The Missouri River was the border between the fast, new, hulking trains billowing with smoke and soot and the squeaky stagecoaches and horse-drawn carriages and the Missouri packet boats shuttled back and forth between the future and the past. Messages came into the Western Union Station in St. Joseph using the fastest technology known to man and left in the satchel of a Pony Express rider on horseback. Life along the Missouri was full of such fascinating, dizzying extremes. There were also plenty of risks, including disease, and soon Fred became gravely ill, diagnosed with typhoid fever. There were no effective treatments available, and he came close to death. His recovery was slow, and he was lucky to be working for a friend, Ford, who was so patient. Yet while he survived the worst of the typhoid, it permanently wreaked havoc on his body, especially his gastrointestinal system. In a photo taken of him after his recovery, he appeared to be a different man, alarmingly gaunt, even a bit haunted, with chin whiskers dangling beneath his flat-lined, expressionless mouth. His wavy hair was combed forward on the sides and swept up in the front in an attempt to obscure his receding hairline and widow's peak. He looked as if he'd been riding packet boats on the river Styx. In case you aren't familiar with the term, the River Styx, spelled S-T-Y-X, was part of Greek mythology, a river crossed by the souls of the dead to get to the underworld. It shows up in Dante's poem, The Inferno, as shown in this engraving by Gustave Doré, with Dante riding in a boat on it to start his trip through the farthest reaches of hell that he describes vividly in the poem. Once the Civil War had started, building new railroads east of the Mississippi ground to a halt. So the little rickety H and SJ Railroad became far more important than one would expect. It was so important that Ulysses S. Grant's first assignment for the Union Army was to guard it. He didn't entirely succeed. In September 1861, the Rebs sabotaged the railroad bridge that the H and SJ crossed just before it reached St. Joseph. It collapsed as a train went over it around midnight on September 3, 1861. The entire train, with 100 passengers, flipped over and fell into the water 30 feet below, killing 17 and injuring many more. But that didn't stop the little railroad. It kept on chugging away. Fred Harvey had been laid up for ill for so long that by the time he returned, all kinds of things had changed. For instance, after only 18 months, the Pony Express was no more. And Western Union had finished a telegraph line that went the whole distance between St. Joseph and Sacramento. No need to take 10 days by pony. A message could be sent in seconds by wire. But sending messages by telegraph was expensive and seldom used by the average American. So the plain old U.S. mail was still the main form of communication. And thus the St. Joseph post office remained vital to the nation at war. Fred went back to work for Captain Ford once his strength returned. And since his wife Ann was pregnant again, the family would need extra money, so Fred took a second job as a postal clerk in February 1862. He was even assigned to a new experimental project the Postal Service was working on. Since 1776, it was the rule that all mail was only to be sorted when it reached a local post office. In July 1862, the government began testing specially equipped train cars that had facilities for mail sorting right on board. The project was a huge success, dramatically reducing time for mail to get to various destinations. It was adopted by the government and became the Railway Mail Service, a part of U.S. Postal Service for over a century. Fred and Anne's second baby was born on October 6, 1862. Unfortunately, in those days of poor medical care, Anne became very ill from complications of the delivery and soon died at only age 27. With two jobs and an infant and a 20-month-old to care for, 
Fred wasted no time in finding a new wife. He had met Barbara Sally Mattis, a recent Czechoslovakian immigrant when he was living in St. Louis. She may even have worked at his restaurant. He made contact with her shortly after Anne's death. She came to St. Joseph, and on February 20th, 1863, they married. She was only 19, taking on a lot of immediate responsibility, but she was a strong woman and up to the task. Meanwhile, Fred was so diligent at his postal job that he earned a good reputation and was soon offered a full-time position with the railroad itself. He became a sales agent for passenger tickets on the H and SJ. After a year of doing that in St. Joseph, his reputation continued to build, and that led to an offer for a better job doing sales for another line of the Joy system, bigger sister of the H and SJ, called the North Missouri Railroad. The only hitch was that he'd have to move again. For many years, the leaders of the city of St. Joseph had been confident that the town was situated in just the right place to become a metropolis in not too many years. They had hoped that when railroad construction began again after the war, the first place a new line would start would be right across the river from St. Joseph, and a railroad bridge could be built over the river to connect eastern trains straight on through to the west. The town could become the major hub for east-west train travel for the northern part of the country, when railroads were ready to build their lines all across the continent. But the owners of the North Missouri Railroad realized that this was highly unlikely. They were betting that the first city on the Kansas side of the river that would get new rail construction was Leavenworth, Kansas, 50 miles south downriver from St. Joseph. And thus, they wanted Fred to set up a ticket sales center in Leavenworth in anticipation of their prediction coming to pass. In Stephen Fried's book, he described Leavenworth very vividly. Even though Leavenworth, Kansas sits at what is almost the exact center of the United States, in 1865 it was still considered the last major outpost of civilization. Although Texas, Nevada, California, and Oregon had already achieved statehood since the 1830s, the contiguous United States had pretty much ended at Fort Leavenworth and the western bank of the Missouri River. The fort served as the quartermaster station for all military posts in the west. And while the fort was a city unto itself, a separate civilian city with a population of 20,000 had grown up just south of its main gates. A company town for the businesses of defending, exploring, and exploiting the West, it was essentially the capital of the American frontier. Fried continued his description. In its utter diversity, ethnic, economic, sociological, Leavenworth was a frontier metropolis that saw itself becoming, if not a New York City for the Wild West, then at least the next St. Louis. It had a large black population which had already established three churches. In fact, Fort Leavenworth would be home to one of the nation's first two black cavalry units, the Buffalo Soldiers. There was a growing Jewish community that founded a synagogue in Kansas and a large German population, many of whom worked in local breweries. And the Indian tribes living nearby, most notably the Potawatomi, were in town regularly. With thousands of troops moving in and out of the fort, Leavenworth was constantly playing host to high-spending soldiers. It boasted some 200 saloons and brothels, and attracted its share of criminals and ne'er-do-wells tossed out by the army, or tossed off boats where the pier met downtown. This rough and tumble town's finest hotel and restaurant was called the Planter's House. The large building with a flag on top seen way on the right in this panoramic sketch, not far from the river, which is seen front and center. When first built in 1856, the owner's intent was for it to provide a luxury spot on the river for the pro-slavery politicians and businessmen of Leavenworth. But just before the Civil War, Kansas declared itself a free state, a refuge for blacks. In 
and a significant portion of the local population shared anti-slavery opinions. At that point, putting business and profits before politics, the planters' owners found a way to not lose money. They created two separate bars in the basement, with a pro-slavery bartender on one side and abolitionist on the other, separated by enough space to keep partisan animosities from bubbling up too often. Stephen Fry describes what it was like at the Planter's House just before the war. The Planter's House became an epicenter of the political divisiveness and border war violence that earned the state its nickname Bleeding Kansas, and its signature customer was Leavenworth's over-the-top mayor, Daniel Reed Anthony, who was willing to go to any length to win an argument, especially about slavery. Several years back, when he owned one of the local newspapers, Anthony had shot and killed a rival editor who criticized his anti-slavery politics and derided his honor. He successfully pleaded self-defense, earning a reputation as a pistol-packing pencil butcher and ushering in a new era of extreme journalism in American frontier newspapers. While Dan Anthony would later become better known as the brother of his suffragette sibling, Susan B. Anthony. He was, in 1865, arguably the most powerful man in Leavenworth. When he took his regular table at the planter's house, he always had twin six-shooters in his holster, in case anyone wanted to talk politics. City hotels back in those times often made their rooms available to rent by traveling salesmen as a temporary place of business, and it was even commonplace for traveling physicians to announce they were setting up shop temporarily in a room in a hotel. As you might guess, these were often self-proclaimed physicians selling snake oil type cures for which they made outlandish claims. A fake doc could sell some of his cures, then skip town before all those folks for whom the cures didn't work, which would have been everybody, came looking to confront him as a con man. After Fred Harvey scoped out Leavenworth before moving there, he figured out that setting up a train ticket office in a room right on the main floor of Planters would attract the most business traffic. He rented the room, and then in February 1885, he fetched his family from St. Joseph and settled them in a rented house just down the street from the Planters. And as usual, he made a big positive impression on the business community, including earning nice comments about himself in the local newspaper. When Fred and family arrived in town, it looked like the Civil War was just about to end. The slaves had been freed, Lincoln had been reelected, and tentative peace talks had begun. Things were looking up for the Harveys and for America. It didn't last long. A scarlet fever epidemic hit the nation in late February, Both the Harvey boys contracted it. Without any antibiotics back in those days, the children had almost no chance. The youngest, Charlie, died on March 2nd, and his brother, Eddie, nine days later on March 11th. And things quickly turned sour for America at the same time. The day Eddie died, Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox to Grant. But five days later, Abraham Lincoln was shot and died the next day. But life moves on after tragedies. By March 1866, Sally Harvey gave birth to her first son. They named him Ford. Three months before that, Fred Harvey, with a new baby on the way, decided he once again needed a second job beyond the railroad ticket sales. He had become very friendly with the staff of the local newspaper, the Leavenworth Conservative. The owners had seen evidence of Fred's successful ways with the public and with sales, so they offered him the position as the paper's general business agent with the chief responsibility to sell ads and subscriptions. His new income finally allowed the Harveys to become active in the life of the city. Fred joined the Masons, he and Sally were regulars attending plays at the local opera house, and they became popular guests and hosts for parties and dinners in the circles of well-known citizens, such as Mayor Anthony. Yes, Fred was beginning to live the middle-class dream for his era. Sally had come from a childhood and youth in poverty 
and couldn't get enough of her new role as hostess and partier. He and Sally loved Leavenworth and the daily life they were living there. So you'd think he might have just settled down and made it hometown into whole old age. Especially since the optimistic view of his railroad employers was that Leavenworth was destined to become a rival to St. Louis in the near future as a main great transportation hub in America. It had aspirations to being a metropolis. It had literally been the first city established in Kansas and the home of the most important military base west of the Mississippi. In order for all this to happen, Leavenworth had to be the first city in Kansas to have train service, or at the very least, its grand future depended on it being on the high iron. High iron was the slang term for a railroad's high-speed tracks that connected main cities. A town with a train station right on the high iron was guaranteed to grow. But if it was relegated to being reached by a small branch set of tracks off the high iron, it was like being at the dead end of a street off a main street in a town. It could get a little business from passengers going to and from the small branch town, and it would have access to export goods. But it wouldn't be on the railroad's bustling main street tracks. Just before the Civil War, there was a competition by three different companies proposing three different routes to have the right to create the first railroad that ran from Missouri all the way to the Pacific. Leavenworth thought it had the winning bid, but in the end, the Lincoln administration chose the Union Pacific's route. It ran 200 miles to the north of Leavenworth through Omaha. It was a straight shot from Chicago and being so far north, more likely to not be affected by actions in the Civil War. After that, Leavenworth hoped that, at the very least, it could be chosen as the location for the first railroad bridge over the Missouri. That would connect Kansas to the eastern train systems and would still make it a major regional transportation hub. Unfortunately, James Joy, the head of the Joy system of railroads and Fred's boss, preferred instead to build his bridge and hub 30 miles downriver from Leavenworth. The area was sparsely populated, but it had something Leavenworth didn't have. Joy owned land in Kansas that would benefit if the bridge was built there, which meant he was lined up to make big profits. Yes, the land was undeveloped at the time, but partly as a result of the eventual choice to put the bridge there, Kansas City is on the spot today. All the new railroads built in Kansas, starting after the war, used that Kansas City location as their main eastern hub. In 1866, Leavenworth did finally get train service, but it was on a short branch line built by the Union Pacific Railroad. It started in Leavenworth and went only as far as Lawrence, Kansas, which was quite a ways southwest of Leavenworth. Lawrence was on the new high iron, so Leavenworth passengers could take the branch line to there and then change trains at Lawrence to travel on the Union Pacific's high iron east to Kansas City or west to Topeka. But as you can see from this map of modern Kansas, it was sure way out of the way to go southwest from Leavenworth to Lawrence and then way back east to get to Kansas City. Of course, you could choose boat travel on the Missouri and get from Leavenworth to Kansas City going directly south, but by the time the railroads were running, they were definitely preferable to boat travel on the rough and temperamental Missouri River. You might think we're going to learn that Fred moved his family quickly after the war to one of the cities south of Leavenworth on the high iron to build his career. But no, Fred had long since learned to be able to grow his business from any location. Here's how Stephen Fry described what happened next with Fred's newspaper work. Even as he was shaking hands with the publishers of The Conservative to clinch the deal, he was, according to a handwritten account of the meeting in his date book, already angling for something else. Once I've sold an ad for you, he asked, would you mind terribly if I solicited for another paper in another town, one that doesn't compete with the conservative? The clients thought about this for a moment. It was a request both audacious and completely logical, as long as Fred could be trusted. Well, said one of the owners, I guess as long as you don't neglect us, I just want to do what's right. So with another handshake, he was also free to sell ads for the St. Joseph Herald, the Kansas Farmer, and several other publications. And none of them ever regretted it. 
Fred Harvey was the best newspaper solicitor I ever knew, said his boss at the conservative. Fred went on to develop similarly complex and fruitful arrangements with the railroads and the adjoining packet boat lines. Several of them put him on monthly retainer because he brought in so much business. The deals weren't all that big as the one was the conservative. The Missouri River packet line, for example, paid him only $40 a month, but it all added up. In the middle of this, Fred was never satisfied. He always kept an eye open for new business opportunities. Fred explained Fred's next exploration for money-making ideas. He wanted every penny he made to work for him. He invested in real estate and made private mortgage loans. He even made one foray back into the restaurant business, a silent partnership in the American house in Ellsworth, Kansas, a resilient young cattle town just reached by the railroads. The popular hotel and restaurant was right on Ellsworth's Snake Row, the raucous part of town frequented by Wild Bill Hickok. In the summer of 1868, when Fred's investment in the American house peaked, Hickok was running for sheriff of Ellsworth, hoping to cash in on his newfound fame. An article about Hickok and Harper's new monthly magazine caused outrage in the West because of its wild claims about the many hundreds of men he had gunned down. In response to the furor, he gave another interview to set the record straight, telling the St. Louis Democrat he had killed considerably over a hundred men, but never without good cause. The stories became the cornerstone of Hickok's legend and one of the earliest examples of national media hype about cowboys. Yet despite all his celebrity, Wild Bill lost the election and soon moved on from Ellsworth, as did Fred once his investment of $4,485.22, which would be about $70,100, was repaid with interest. By the 1950s, when I was a child, the mythology of the Western cowboy was in full swing. After his death in 1876, as recorded in this newspaper story of the time, Dime novels had been written back in the late 1800s about Wild Bill Hickok, obviously greatly exaggerating his exploits. None of them seemed based on very much actual historical facts and documentation, but mostly wild extrapolations from the little bit of information, rumors, and myths about him and his escapades. Along with a lot of yarn spinning he did in his lifetime to expand his reputation. This was true of most of the well-known names in cowboy lore. Among a huge amount of public relations materials in vintage books and newspaper articles touting Hickok's life and times, there was a silent film made about him in 1923 and novels written in 1926 and 1937. By the time of my childhood in the 1950s, there was a Classics Illustrated comic lending a veneer of authenticity to his story, even though it was no doubt mostly based on embellished stories invented in the past rather than much of anything in real history. There were many colorfully illustrated Hickok novels and comic books aimed at young boys, equally devoid of any reality. And there was even a TV series about him from 1951 to 1958. I actually had a childhood crush on Guy Madison, who played Wild Bill on the show, and really enjoyed the standard humorous antics of his laughable sidekick named Jingles, played by Andy Devine. But I'm betting the Wild Bill Hickok, who was running for mayor in Ellsworth, Kansas, in 1868, bore precious little resemblance in the slightest to the fictional representations of him, and I'll bet no one even vaguely like Jingles hung out with him. It is amazing to look back and see how much Fred was accomplishing and would accomplish throughout his life. That bout with typhoid when he was younger left him with chronic health problems that flared up regularly and forced him to take a day or two off or more to stay in bed to wait for them to subside. In 
everything from severe intestinal issues and insomnia to what was probably clinical depression. But throughout his whole life, Fred plowed through these and continued climbing the ladder in his business life. He and Sally had another child, a girl named Minnie. Fred's expanding business allowed him to afford to purchase a four-bedroom house just down the street from his office at Planter's House and to have a small live-in staff, two teenagers from Kentucky, William as a general servant, and Maggie as cook and housekeeper. This is that home as it looks today, being refurbished to serve as a Fred Harvey Museum in Leavenworth. Before long, Fred moved up to a larger railroad on the Joy system, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, usually referred to as the Burlington. He became their general western agent for freight. It gave him much more responsibilities than his old railroad job, so he stopped selling newspaper ads in the east and instead crisscrossed the land west of the Missouri, selling the railroad services to farmers, ranchers, miners, manufacturers, anyone who had a lot of stuff to ship. It didn't matter what, Fred could figure out how to ship it. As author Fried puts it, Fred was at the service of anyone with large-scale shipping needs, no matter how challenging. He arranged for the shipping of vast quantities of hay, corn, wheat, millet, potatoes, live chickens, hogs, cattle or sheep, meats, freshly butchered or cured, wool and pelts, copper ore, salt, oil, coal, ice, explosive powder, lumber to build entire towns, 50 or 60 train loads at a time, enough railroad ties to traverse entire counties. There was even a big business in shipping bones, primarily the bones of all the buffalo that had been slaughtered for hides, sport, or national security. The government believed that the best way to keep Americans safe from Indian attacks was to wipe out the herds they depended on to live, so it was not uncommon for people just to shoot them at random. In places like Hutchinson, Kansas, buffalo bones were collected from the prairies, brought to the depot to be sold for 6 to $8 a ton, and then hauled east to be made into fertilizer or bone china. All these years later, of course, it is sad to look at photos of such piles. The U.S. literally almost succeeded in a very short few years at driving the bison to extinction. In the end, there were only a few hundred left of the hundreds of millions that had roamed the prairies. It took an extreme effort in 1899, led by Theodore Roosevelt and others interested in the problem, to protect those final specimens and breed them again, to release on the plains long after the Indian uprisings had ended. Stephen Fry describes Fred's methods of self-education in doing business. While the financial institutions of the East sold money and bonds to one another, Fred Harvey was working on the front lines of the essential American economy, raw materials, agriculture, goods and services. And as he watched the ebb and flow of hundreds of Western businesses, he paid close attention to best practices and worst practices, gentlemen and scoundrels, the value of trust, and the relentlessness of the cycles. He loved to listen to businessmen complain about their problems as much as brag about their successes, and he soaked up everything. Fred was like an opportunistic sponge, recalled one of his grandsons. He fed on others' talents, and he exploited these people, as he concurrently, not subsequently, learned from them. He asked many questions and always pressed for practical solutions as they invented wheel after wheel. In the first few years after the end of the Civil War in 1865, new train lines and extensions of existing lines occurred at breakneck speed. Every time this happened, Fred's opportunities expanded. The biggest boost was the completion of the first transcontinental railroad in 1869. You likely remember seeing pictures like this one in your grade school American history book, where two train tracks and two engines met. The Central Pacific Railroad was building track going east from the Pacific coast, and the Union Pacific was building track going west from Omaha. They were to meet at a point near Promontory Point in Utah, where the tracks would be joined together by a golden symbolic spike driven into the rails by the heads of the two railroads. <music> 
This was the completion of the Great Transcontinental Railway, accompanied by the ceremony you see here on May 10, 1869. Well, that sounded all neat and tidy in the history books, but it's not exactly accurate. The tracks didn't really run smoothly completely across the continent. The last stretch of track built, and all the media hoopla shown in this scene that made it into the history books, made it look like train travel could go at that unhindered from Sacramento to the eastern seaboard. Except for one thing. There was still no bridge over the wild Missouri River at Omaha. That didn't get done until three years later in 1872. So at first, when a train from the east reached the Missouri across from Omaha, it had to be emptied of passengers and freight. They would be loaded onto ferries or barges and get to Omaha, where they would be loaded on a new train to carry on their trip from there. If the river froze in the winter, they sometimes even laid temporary tracks across the ice and kept the east train moving west. But then the ever-expanding railroad bubble burst. Stephen Fry describes the 1872 equivalent of the later 1929 crash in the U.S. financial system. The Union Pacific Bridge at Omaha wasn't completed until 1872. By then, the Hannibal Bridge at Kansas City had also been built, so trains were finally free to traverse much of the country. Railroad companies were laying tracks as fast as the rails could be forged and the wooden ties cut, turning the nation into a huge board game, building not only to provide needed transportation, but also in many cases to block competitors. As the railroads consolidated and grew in the go-go post-war economy, their stocks were increasingly controlled by a small group of powerful eastern financiers who all sat on one another's boards, slapped one another's backs, and smoked the best cigars. But the railroad industry's unprecedented power carried equally unprecedented risks. In the early fall of 1872, Fred started noticing that in every city he visited, the local papers carried bigger and bigger stories about a financial scandal involving the builders of the Transcontinental Railroad. Union Pacific executives were accused of looting profits from the Transcontinental Railroad through a questionable company they created and gave a foreign-sounding name, Credit Mobilier. Not only did this company receive no-bid contracts to build much of the railroad, but several members of Congress who voted on train funding were allowed to buy Credit Mobilier stock at bargain rates. No criminal charges were ever filed, and only two of the congressmen were even censured. But the Credit Mobilier scandal spooked European investors, who were the ones who owned most of America's railroad stock. Much of the concern focused on the Philadelphia-based financier Jay Cook, whose investment banking firm had helped Lincoln finance the Civil War by selling war bonds and who in peacetime became incredibly powerful by underwriting railroad development. Cook's current obsession was building his own transcontinental railroad, a train line directly to the Pacific Northwest. He attempted to float $300 million, worth $5.6 billion today, in government railroad bonds to build his new line. But when rival financier J.P. Morgan thwarted Cook's efforts at financing, European investors became even more nervous, and they started dumping all of their American railroad stocks. J. Cook's brokerage company declared bankruptcy on Thursday, September 18, 1873, triggering a worldwide financial panic and a Black Friday sell-off on Wall Street. On the following Monday, the New York Stock Exchange did not open, the first time in its history that the exchange had ever halted trading. It remained closed for 10 days, and when it reopened, the market had lost so much of its value that the country was plunged into a depression. Tens of thousands of businesses failed. Bubbles bursting, screamed the front page headline in the Chicago Tribune. Train stock prices dropped nearly 60%, and more than half of the nation's railroad owners were forced into bankruptcy. Fred's boss, James Joy, was one of the hardest hit, and the Joy system unraveled. Luckily, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy 
which signed Fred's paychecks, remained stable enough to avoid receivership. But although Kansas escaped the 1873 crash, it had its own plague the next summer, a plague of grasshoppers, specifically named the Rocky Mountain Locusts. First seen on July 4, 1874, they looked like black rain, as you see in this photo, as they descended to feast on everything in sight. And that means almost everything. They could eat a whole county's crops in a matter of days. They ate wool off live sheep. They landed on people and started devouring their clothes. And they devoured anything made of wood, including paper and tool handles. Sometimes several inches thick on the ground, they could cover railroad tracks and make them too slimy for the locomotives to get any traction, effectively stopping even rail travel at times. And it wasn't just Kansas. Have a look at the map of the plague as it hit a large swath of the U.S. Here's what much of the land looked like after the locusts had passed. As you can see, this was as devastating as the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. This led to a lot of dark humor. Sometimes facing how absurd a situation is and trying to laugh through it is the only answer to a chaotic situation such as the locust plague that year. This cartoon was no doubt one of many that were drawn to try to put a humorous spin on the horrific. Stephen Fried noted, In his travels across Kansas, Fred saw people raking up piles of live grasshoppers or using plows or sheets of metal smeared with tar as makeshift hopper dozers or mixing the insects into the cement for the foundations of new buildings. And all anyone could do was laugh at the absurdity of the situation. While the plague was devastating, the humor helped them get through. Kansans developed an even greater resolve to overcome the nation's economic woes and their own agricultural nightmares, reassuring one another that 1875 would be a great year, a landmark year. And indeed, it ended up being a landmark year. I don't know how well Kansas farmers did in 1875, but that was the year Fred Harvey entered the threshold of what was to become his destiny for the rest of his life. At almost 40, in spite of how well Fred was doing in his businesses, as seen by someone from the outside, inside it seems he had an intense desire to achieve something on a much grander scale. He admired famous successful men like Vanderbilt and Morgan and yearned to, you might say, do something more in their league. The American businessman Fred admired the most was George Pullman. Pullman had come west around the same time as Fred to seek his fortune, but by 1875 he was a millionaire many times over and his name familiar around the world for the luxury train car industry he built. He had long been disappointed at the miserable accommodations on trains, both regular sitting cars and sleeping cars designed for overnight travel. The earliest sleeping cars had consisted of unventilated cars, heated with stoves, and outfitted with little bed alcoves, sometimes stacked three high. Pullman had ridden in one of those and pronounced the atmosphere to be something dreadful. His own earliest attempts at trying to redesign these cars was in 1859, and he continued to tinker with them occasionally, but the Civil War intervened and it wasn't until just after the war that he unveiled his first personal attempt to build his first sleeping car from scratch. Stephen Fry described it this way. The pioneer, actually the Pullman pioneer, because his name became part of the sales pitch, was longer and higher than any previous train car and was so luxuriously appointed that it was as if he had taken a fine Victorian mansion and put it on cushioned wheels. The finishes on the wood grain interiors were so lustrous that trainmen started referring to private cars and the fancy people who rode in them as varnish. The Pullman sleeper was an immediate sensation, 
not only because of its opulence, the murals on the ceilings, the chandeliers, the marble countertops in the bathrooms, and the exotic carpeting on which no man would consider spitting, but also because of its technical wizardry. There were various patentable contraptions that allowed the berths to be easily transformed into seating or storage space during daylight hours, and the ventilation system let in fresh air while keeping out the dust and cinders. By the time Pullman decided to incorporate his company in 1867, a relatively new way of setting up a business, already popular with the industrialists whose ranks he was joining, he had built four dozen of these sleepers and had launched his first hotel cars, which had drawing rooms and round-the-clock full-service kitchens. But the more luxurious cars he built, the more he realized there was a huge problem with his enterprise. The railroads did a poor job taking care of passengers. They were good at laying and maintaining track, buying and maintaining cars, handling boxcars, but there was a reason that trainmen often joked, freight doesn't complain. Passenger service was terrible, and railroads did not have the kind of staff needed to take care of wealthier customers. Train conductors did not make good butlers or waiters, so Pullman decided to staff all his own cars and not use railroad employees at all. The extra fare Pullman passengers paid went to him, not to the railroads. His cars were like rolling hotels, attached to the trains, yet separated from them. And then there was the nature of that staff. As Fried explained in his book, Pullman also decided that his new staff should be exclusively black. His porters quickly became the first major workforce of free black men in the country, eventually forming the foundation for America's black middle class. This did not necessarily reflect any particular progressiveness on Pullman's part. Some historians believe he chose to hire black men primarily because they were cheap and available and because he and his white customers didn't regard them as full-fledged human beings. Since porters might be around white women disrobing or white men stumbling drunk back to their berths, perhaps from someone else's, Pullman wanted an employee, according to one scholar, whom passengers could regard as part of the furnishings rather than a mortal with likes, dislikes, and a memory. He hired only the most dark-skinned men and especially in the early years left them largely nameless. They were often referred to as boy or generically as George. That said, this still was one of the best and best paying jobs for black men in the country. So the opportunity to be a George was highly coveted and the Pullman service on trains was uniformly excellent. By the 1870s, Pullman had gone into partnership with Andrew Carnegie. That gave him access to capital to continue building his budding empire and allowed him to acquire the two biggest contracts in the world of trains. He was engaged to build all the sleepers for the Pennsylvania Railroad, which dominated business in the East, and for the Union Pacific's new transcontinental railway. Pullman also built luxurious dining cars that had good meals and service. But at the time, trains had no way to go from one car to the other while the train was in motion. So you could only go to the dining car when the train stopped for water or the like, and once the train started up again, before you finished your meal, you were stuck in the dining car until the next stop. That might be hours away. So the other option, which most people had to take, was to have their meals at restaurants located inside railroad stations. And the New York Times, back in that era, had this to say about such eating establishments. If there is any word in the English language more shamefully misused than another, it is the word refreshment as applied to the hurry-scurry of eating and drinking at railroad stations. Directors of railroads appear to have an idea that travelers are destitute of stomach, that eating and drinking are not at all necessary to human beings bound on long journeys, and that nothing more is required than to put them through their misery in as brief a time as possible. It is expected that three or four hundred men, women, and children can be whirled half a day over a dusty road with hot cinders flying in their faces. And then when they approach a station and are dry, dying of weariness, hunger, and thirst, 
longing for an opportunity to bathe their faces at least before partaking of their much-needed refreshments, that they shall rush helter-skelter into a dismal long room and dispatch a supper, breakfast, or dinner in 15 minutes. The consequences of such savage and unnatural feeding are not reported by telegraph as railroad disasters, but if a faithful account were given of them, we are afraid they would be found much more serious than any that are caused by the smashing of cars or the breaking down of bridges. And this is where Fred Harvey comes in. With all his train travels, Fred was intimately familiar with how horrendous the problem was. And since the railroads themselves hadn't come up with a solution to this problem, Fred was certain that there was big money to be made by the person who did solve it. He was also certain that person should be Fred Harvey. At first he tried getting a partner and getting hired by the Kansas Pacific Railroad to take over three eating houses along the railroad's route in Kansas and Colorado. That venture fell through when the partners quickly realized they didn't work together well at all, and the Kansas Pacific insisted it wasn't going to help out with expenses in any way other than to provide the location. Fred then tried to convince his bosses at the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad that he could make their eating houses in Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas very profitable. They weren't interested. But they encouraged Fred that there was a small, newer railroad called the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe that was getting well known for taking risks to grow their business. Just by good luck, Fred happened to know the superintendent of the Santa Fe, Charlie Morse, when he worked in Nebraska for a different railroad. And here is where Fred's ultimate giant destiny begins with a tiny, small step. The Santa Fe's Topeka Depot had a 20-seat lunchroom on its second floor. It was much smaller than any other eating houses Fred had tried out, but the difference here was that Morse assured Fred he could run it exactly as he pleased. And using all the savvy and negotiating Fred had developed over the years, Fred negotiated a fantastic deal for himself. He would get the space rent-free. The Santa Fe would cover all the utilities, heat, gas, coal, and ice, and it would throw in free transportation for all the provisions, including food, that Fred would use in the restaurant, and free transportation for his employees. It would also cover the expense of all the -the behind-the-scenes equipment, like ovens, stoves, sinks, and ice boxes. Fred's responsibility would be to pay for the food itself, wages for laborers, and any upgrade he wanted to do to the actual eating room, such as furniture, linen, and table settings. After that, he could keep any profits the restaurant made. If the eating establishment was a success, its reputation would directly provide profits for the Santa Fe by attracting customers to use their railroad line. There was no written contract. Both men just shook hands in a gentleman's agreement. Those don't always work. But back in that era, a certain type of businessman made it a matter of honor to stick to such agreements. Fred Harvey was that kind of man his whole life. That handshake jump-started Fred's destiny when the restaurant opened for business in January 1876. That handshake began a relationship that lasted between Fred Harvey and the Santa Fe Railroad for the rest of his life and passed on to his sons and daughters in charge of the business after his death. A relationship that was eventually wildly profitable for the two businesses and profitable in many ways for the whole nation. From this point on, Fred Harvey begins making bigger and bigger steps into his destiny. We'll stride along with him as he does so in the next entry in this series, Extreme Makeover, 
Wild West Edition, Fred Harvey begins setting a higher standard.